If you ask people that are coming from the ketogenic world, they will tell you that in range is anywhere from 70 to 110. They literally make a cutoff of 110 and they refer to a glucose spike as being anything over 110. And I'm like, where did you come up with this? It doesn't make sense. If you look in the research, you'll see that non diabetic physiological blood glucose variation can go as high as 153 in the post-meal state. Hello. Welcome back. Hi. And we have Cyrus here with us today. He is our special guest for today's continued conversation on CGM technology. What's up, ladies? How are you guys doing today? We're doing great. Doing great. Excited for this conversation. It's only going to get a little bit hotter about the uh, continuous glucose monitors part two. Well, I know because when you guys had uh, told me that you were talking about CGMs, I, Im I immediately got jealous because I wanted to be able to participate in the conversation. Um, and uh, as we're going to see in this deep dive today, it's it's not coming from a positive place. <laughs> I do not like CGM technology and I'm going to tell you all the reasons why. But I'll also, you know, I'm not going to be uh, a, a negative uh, the entire time. There's definitely some pros and some cons, but we can get into it and really explain the, 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 the frustrations that I've been experiencing over the past couple of months with CGMs for sure. I love that because you're a study that's been, how long have you been on a CGM? What's your um, About 15 minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I have been using a CGM now for the better part of, I'll call it two months. So it's actually pretty brand new technology to me, for sure, because it's been around for such a long time. But I wasn't able to get insurance coverage for it. And as you guys know, it's a pretty expensive device. So I finally got insurance to cover it after a whole after two months of back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And long story short, I finally started wearing it. And here we are today, two months down the road. Uh, and I don't love it. You know, I, I get the experience of seeing Cyrus fighting with the CGM. So <laughs> I know that a lot of times it can be really frustrating to use. And, and we're trying to learn together how to use this. And, you know, again, we, we've talked a little bit in the past about the, the role of our partner on our journey with our health and in diabetes support. And it's been really interesting because I was a really big proponent of the CGM for a lot of reasons. Um, and yet now I'm, I am seeing also the effects of some of the frustrations and the challenges of using this technology. Yeah, completely agree with you. I have my moments too, and I've been on and off different sensor systems for, I guess, about eight years. So that's where last, last week's episode came in is kind of having these great habits. And now we're going to hear about Cyrus's experiences that I'm sure so many people are going to be feeling it. It's going to resonate with them. You know, me too. This is what I deal with. And that's exactly why we need to start talking about CGM, how they work, how they don't work, and crack open the conversation. So at the end of your, your guys' last conversation, um, I appreciated the fact that you um, made some distinctions here between measuring blood glucose versus interstitial glucose. So we can get into all the details of exactly what it's measuring and why that's a, a big deal. But Lauren, one of the things you said at the end of your podcast was that you really like CGM technology and you are glad that it exists and you think it's a huge step forward for people in the, you know, who are monitoring their blood glucose. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, you know what? I want to feel the same way as you. I really do. I want to be all positive about the fact that CGMs exist and that people are getting a lot of value out of them, and especially for people who are living with diabetes. Um, but like the contrast is that my own personal experience with it has been just frustrating. So the first thing that I'll say here is that um, I th the, I've been thinking long and hard about what is it that like really frustrates me at, its, at, at my core and I think the number one biggest frustration for me is the fact that the I'm, I'm using a Freestyle Libre 3. So that's the most recent Abbott product, the Freestyle Libre. They had the two and then they recently released the three. And I was given access to that. My insurance company did not give me access to use the Dexcom G6 or the G7. And that's ultimately what I wanted to use because I knew and I had heard that there's the Dexcom is actually more accurate than the Freestyle. But I said, you know what? It's okay. Um, you know, I'll try out the freestyle, see what happens. Um, what I have come to learn over the course of the last two months using it is that the Libre 3 can be up to 20% inaccurate. 20% inaccurate. And at first, on paper, you're like, okay, whatever, it's 20%. Who cares about 20%? It's not a big deal. But then as I started using it and started recognizing what does 20% actually mean, I was shocked, like literally shocked 
that you can have a device that had to go through human clinical trials and is an FDA approved class two medical device that has billions of dollars of research behind it. And yet when I'm checking my blood glucose, I'll get a reading on the CGM of 196 with a straight arrow going up. But then when I check my blood glucose on my blood glucose meter, it's 151. And I'm sitting here looking at the two of them and I'm like, 196 versus 151? I know the right answer is 151 because that's my blood glucose. You take a look at the CGM and it's 40 something points off, right? That's about 20%, right? Now, if that was just a one-time thing, all right, fine, no big deal, I'll give it to you. But what I have done over the course of the last two months is take logist- realistically 150 different blood glucose checks to see how close the blood glucose meter is versus the CGM. And the closest agreement that I could get between the two of those devices is 15 points. So either the Libre is 15 points above or 15 points below what the blood glucose uh, meter is reading. And the largest difference is about 45 points. And there seems to be no correlation between, you know, there's no way for me to know if I can trust the number that's coming off of the CGM, right? And that's frustrating. That's really frustrating because as I've been using it, I'm sort of thinking to myself like, man, are there other things in this world that are that inaccurate, right? Like, The analogy that I think to myself is like, imagine you're driving down the road in your car and you look at your speedometer and your speedometer was 20% 20 inaccurate, right? So you get pulled over by a police officer. The police officer goes, hey, excuse me, sir, do you know how fast you were driving? And your answer to him is, well, I'm somewhere between 40 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour, but I'm not really sure because I can't trust my speedometer, right? That's a big difference, right? Or here's another silly analogy. Like imagine if the gas gauge in your car was 20% inaccurate, right? You know, it's like halfway, it says that it's a half of a tank and you're like, well, I don't know, maybe there's a fourth of a tank. Maybe there's a three quarters of a tank. I don't really know. I'm not sure when I'm supposed to go to the freaking gas station anymore, right? Um, or my best analogy here is imagine if your bank balance was 20% inaccurate, right? You go and you deposit $1,000 into your bank account And then the next time you check your balance, the balance could be as low as $800 or as high as $1,200. And your bank's like, oh, I'm sorry, we're 20% inaccurate. Uh, You know, check back with us, right? So like, I understand that this thing's not going to be 100% accurate all the time, but we're in 2024 for heaven's sakes. And this is a device that has a lot of money and a lot of technology behind it. I personally expect much closer than 20%. I want it to be something like 5% accurate or inaccurate. And if it was that level of accuracy, I would be much happier. You guys tell me, am I just being too neurotic? No. Can I tell you about a study, Cyrus? Hit me. All right. 2024. Hmm. Yep. Okay. I couldn't, I was so excited when I found, I was so excited when I found this because I did not know, you know, reading this was like watching an exciting movie. Like, how is it going to end? Where are we going to go with this? And it's finally something that came out comparing the Dexcom G7, which is their newest model, and Abbott's Libre 3, which is their newest model. It came out in January. So we're just a couple months out from this, which is really cool. Got my hands on this right away. And I've had my own uh, studies on this where I compared, I think I was on either Libre 1 and 2, and I compared it with the G6 at one point in time and really kind of wavered between which was more accurate. As someone who's active, I thought the G6 was a better option. That's just personal story and and how that worked. So what's interesting about this study, and I'll just give you a couple tidbits because I have a feeling you're going to want to look at this much closer than what I'm going to give you right now. But yes, they mentioned the plus or minus, the 20% variability, that that is what they're finding between both systems. And that to them in their business world and the FDA approval world is certainly acceptable, which is really interesting because the Libre technology has been around since the early 2000s. They put these on a couple of bike racers that raced across America back in 2007. They were testing this model before that. And that's how I got really turned on to sensors and activity as I read about these bike racers and I wanted to get my hands on this tech. So it's been a while. They've been working on this and it's still not accurate with every single sensor. So currently the sensor I'm on 
has been pretty accurate, quite honestly. And I've had some, I've had a tricky week on my hands. The sensor that you've been on most recently, you want to rip it off your arm and throw it out the window. Well, they're going to take an average of those two and then they're going to go, eh, well, they're looking pretty good. So as we go through this study, what I find to be amazing is they specifically called out that when they did not track sensor accuracy was when blood glucose was rapidly rising or rapidly falling. And if you live with type 1 diabetes, that is the most critical time to have accuracy, especially if you've been on a bike and you're 30 miles from home or you're in the middle of a three-mile jog or you're brand new to this life and you need to know the difference here and you want to feel safe. So trust, of course, is a very valid feeling and reaction and the lack of mistrust. So as I'm going through this, I go, okay, so which one's more accurate? What's, what's the, what's the end? What's the punchline here? here? Right. What's the line? So they concluded that the Freestyle Libre 3 was more accurate than the G7. Oh, the expression on your face. I'm seeing some body language. Okay. Yep. It was more accurate. Now, I get to the very bottom of the study because I'm always curious about, you know, what else are we citing here? How large was the study? Let me just recap and look at the conclusion. But don't ever stop there if you're reading a study. Go all the way down. And guess who designed and funded the study? Abbott, my friend. (gasps) Of course they, were the they ones did. Who did it. Yeah, of course. And not okay. to say, right, like not to say this is all wrong. Clearly, this is a clinical trial. We're looking at the data here, but it's been published. And they're, you know, that's where I'm always curious about what else is going on because anecdotally, we talk to people that are on all kinds of different systems and we have to work with people on a very individual basis with sensors. That's why I have a love hate relationship with them. That's where we talked about the habits and being able to trust yourself if you think that that data that you're getting this generating from the sensor is goofy is being able to stop and say, mm, 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 no, no, no. I'm going to trust myself in this situation and troubleshoot and move on. Wow. That's fascinating. Actually. Um, it brings up the point here that, you know, a couple of things. Number one, when you're reading a research paper, always take a look at the funding sources always, because there could be a conflict of interest. And that actually is happening more and more and more in the research world. And if you don't read that, then you can just sort of interpret the results at face value. Oftentimes, even if the data says a particular thing, the conclusion of the paper is an interpretation by a human being. And so sometimes the interpretation can have a little bit of a twist on it, depending on who actually funded the study and who wanted to put dollars behind it. So that's a really good point. If we go back to just thinking about accuracy as a general idea, right? Imagine 20% accuracy as being the difference. If you're living with type 2 diabetes, okay, a 20% inaccuracy is the difference between a blood glucose that's technically in range, which is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, okay, versus a fasting blood glucose that's out of range and higher than 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter. In other words, if you're living with type 2 diabetes and your goal is to try and keep your blood glucose under 100 and you check your blood glucose meter and you see the numbers are 92, you're going to take a giant sigh of relief. You're going to be like, oh, okay, cool. Things are moving in the right direction. But if you add 20% inaccuracy on top of that, now you check your blood glucose using a CGM and instead of reading a 92, it could read 117. Okay? That's the difference between you having a really ideal blood glucose measurement first thing in the morning and knowing that you're moving in the right direction and then also checking your blood glucose afterwards and being like, why isn't this program working? How come this diet isn't working? How come exercise isn't working? And before you know it, you start to point a finger at all the other things that you're trying to do and then you're like, well, maybe I should switch over to doing something different when in reality, all of it was just boiling down to the fact that the device you're using is not accurate enough. And then for people who are living with type 1 diabetes like you and me, Lauren, I mean, uh, the difference between, <laughs> you know, a 40-point difference in, your, in, in a blood glucose reading is, is very challenging because I know you're not supposed to make a decision about injecting insulin based only off of a CGM reading. They tell you that in very big, bold letters. They say, if you're going to inject insulin, please check your blood glucose using a blood glucose meter. Okay, fine. I'll give that to you. I get it right? But 
what is the point of wearing, like if somebody living with type one diabetes who has to inject insulin anywhere from, I don't know, one, two, three, four, call it four times a day at the minimum, upwards of like six times a day, depending how, how often you eat food. Okay. If I have to use a, bl- a test strip every single time I'm going to make an insulin dosing decision and I'm wearing a CGM simultaneously, then I'm basically using two different technologies that don't agree with each other to try and educate me about what I'm supposed to do with my blood, what I'm supposed to do when I'm injecting insulin. Okay. So that can become a little bit annoying because now all of a sudden I have two devices. I have my cell phone open. I'm looking at this number. I'm like, okay, let me look at this trend over here. And then I have my blood glucose meter and I'm like, okay, I think this is the right answer. And this is off by a little bit. So what am I supposed to do? And this is showing an up arrow and this doesn't show any arrow. And, uh, you know, and then at a certain point, I'm like, well, now that means that I have to have a blood glucose meter with a prescription for test strips, and that can add up in cost, in addition to the cost of the actual sensor for the, for the continuous glucose monitor. And so there were many times within the last two months where I'm sitting here with two devices, trying to make sense of the two of them in order to make an intelligent decision about what I'm going to do for insulin. And then I'm sitting here and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? I could just turn off the CGM and say, you know what, CGM, you're just giving me problems and you're making me mentally frustrated. And I will just trust the blood glucose meter because it is the right answer. So if I have the right answer in front of me, then why am I looking to another device to try and give me another right answer that's only going to frustrate me? Okay. That's my experience. But again, like maybe I'm just overthinking this. You you tell me if you guys have any different ideas on this. I want to ask Kylie something. Just as a as kind of a prompt, because Kylie is a partner, but also as a a very a coach with a lot of miles and experience, is as you know, as you hear the questioning, you know, with Cyrus kind of thinking, um, I've I know how to do this, I know how to deal with my body, but then all of a sudden this thing is throwing everything sideways. How do you coach the mindset around? CGM. Yeah. Well, it's very difficult. I mean, because we've been, the conversations we've been having are basically like Cyrus is like handing it over. He's like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. (laughs) You do it. You look at this. You tell me what I'm doing. And it's really frustrating. And I don't know, um, you know, in our personal life. Okay. So kind of to back up a little bit, you know, for the time that I've known Cyrus, he's been doing all blood glucose monitoring and it's been very predictable and very, it's felt very safe. And there's been many, many, many reasons why I never really pushed hard for the CGM because we felt very, everything was very easy. It felt very simple. And one of the things that I've experienced with this change is that it's made the process of blood glucose management, the discussions have been so much harder. Like it's hard for me to know what to say to him other than, well, did you check with the blood? Did you check your actual blood glucose? (laughs) Like, and then I feel like, you know, again, as a partner, am I just, am I bugging him, you know, or that like, um, and so I've, I feel like the decision-making, the, the fact that Insulin or, you know, for type one diabetes, insulin injection is, is not reliable on that information, on that data, just complicates the situation so much more. And, um, I think the coaching really comes down to maybe a little bit of patience, you know, giving, stepping into the experimental mindset where we're going to try try it on for a little bit. Let's see where it is working for us. How is this information serving us? Where are we finding it to be useful? Like asking those kinds of questions for ourselves. And my answer truly comes down to, I, I'm happy if we're just using it at night. You know, we unfortunately have experienced times where blood glucose has dropped overnight, where there you know, we don't have any alert for that. And it's scary to me, especially considering, you know, we have a daughter. When it was just the two of us, it felt like a little bit easier to manage that um, overnight hypoglycemia. And even if I'm having to offer support to Cyrus now with a third person in the house, you know, it does bring up that challenge. And so the coaching or the maybe how I would approach the coaching aspect of that would be, 
where is this serving you? Where is this technology get, getting you something positive? Where is the um, information being like useful for you? And if there's not a point in the day where it's useful, then maybe it's not the right technology right now at this time. Maybe it's not the right piece of equipment for us. But overnight, if it beeps at us when you're becoming hypoglycemic, even if you're getting a false reading at that time, I'm okay with that. You know, like I'd rather be falsely alarmed than risk not having been alarmed at all on overnight hypoglycemia, right? So I'd say that um, in terms of like learning, it's like one thing to experiment with this and learn something. And if the, if what we're learning is that this is just too frustrating and our system before was much better and much happier for our lifestyle, then that's okay. But is there a place for this device? Is there a place for this equipment and technology somewhere? And for some people, it's I've, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people who have used the CGM and they love it because, for example, the trend lines can be very informative, right? So sometimes it'll hold people a little bit more accountable to some of the green light activities. Like, oh, well, when I walk after my meal, I really do see my blood glucose going. I can see it. It's like proof that this is really working. And for me, that feels good. So I'm going to keep wearing it for that reason, right? It just holds me a little more accountable to my activities and my green light choices. Um, but you know, in our lives with me and Cyrus, I'm not sure that this device is going to be the best thing for our marriage <laughs> during the daytime hours. <laughs> <During the day. laughs> well said. That's what it all boils down to. <laughs> Am I bothering you too much? That's really. I that's can't really handle. It. Yeah, exactly. I can't handle you yelling at that thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but again, I think that people have to, you know, think, I think that's important for people to evaluate, like just because you were prescribed this piece of equipment, which by the way, I could go into a whole other conversation about how somebody with type one diabetes was denied multiple times access to this device. I mean, that to me, the, ins- the whole insurance situation was just I could go down a whole path on that, but I won't. Um, but it's just another its another challenge. But if, just because you're prescribed this equipment, is this equipment really giving you the right information? And the other thing about that, and I don't, you know, I, I want to, of course, bring this back to the conversation, but you can replicate what a CGM is showing you through blood glucose monitoring. It takes a little bit more effort and it can be causing, you know, you have to do more finger sticks, but you can, you can gather information about your blood glucose trending using blood glucose technology and not using CGM technology. You can, you absolutely can. (laughs) And we've done that with some of our, you know, some of our clients are happy with their blood glucose meter and they'll just test that out a little bit sometimes. Okay. So I think you bring up a a lot of really good points there, Kylie. So uh, let me, let me chime in here to give the backstory of what you were talking about using the CGM as a uh, monitor at night. It's an insurance policy while you're sleeping. Okay. So, the number one value that the Libre 3 has brought to my life, and I will give credit where credit is due, no question, is that the Libre 3 is a device that warns me if my blood glucose is dropping low in the middle of the night. There's, there's two different scent, um, alarms that you can set on it. Number one is when your blood glucose hits the low glucose threshold, which is at 70, and I've actually increased it to being 80 milligrams per deciliter. And then the second one is when your blood glucose is critically low at 55. You cannot turn that that alarm off. So effectively, if your blood glucose is dropping and you happen to sleep through your first alarm and then it gets to 55, it'll trigger a second alarm and then hopefully that one will wake you up, right? So this is a complete lifesaver because I've been wearing it for two months and the number one reason why we got the CGM technology on me in the first place was because I was going low at night, okay? Okay. And so there was an episode back in San Francisco, back in, I'm trying to remember, was it 2016 maybe, Kylie? 2015? 14. 14. (laughs) Where, um, for people living with type 1 diabetes, this is like an absolute nightmare scenario. I inject Lantus at night before I go to sleep on purpose because that's uh, what I've been doing for the past, you know, 15 years. And it's a way to get, to make sure that the, uh, the Lantus that I inject is, is maximally effective in the middle of the night to keep my blood glucose controlled while I'm sleeping. Okay. So I give myself approximately 11 units of Lantus at about 9 o'clock p.m., at about 10 o'clock p.m., and then I usually hit the sack maybe 30 to 40 minutes later, okay? One night after we had friends come over for dinner, um, Kylie was in the bathroom getting ready for bed, and I went to the fridge to go pull out 11 units of Lantus, and I injected it. 
The problem was that I injected 11 units of Humalog on accident. It was just short acting Lauren's face, she knows exactly what that means. (laughs) Humalog is fast acting insulin. Lantus is slow acting basal insulin. So I gave myself 11 units of very powerful rapid acting insulin thinking that I was giving myself 11 units of slow acting, not so powerful insulin. And then I didn't eat any food because why would you eat food before bed? Go. Yeah. For some context, that's the mealtime insulin. So normally, even with a very large meal of you know, fruits and a smoothie bowl, you know, things that you're eating with a lot of carbohydrate, normally you would inject somewhere between two and five units for a meal, for even a very large meal of carbohydrate rich foods. So you're talking um, a double and a half of, or some, or possibly three times what you would normally even take even for a meal during the day. So that's exactly right. Exactly right. The the largest meal I will ever eat is usually somewhere around six units of insulin. Um, but most of the time it's like four is my, is my, is my maximum. So I gave myself effectively two and a half to three times the amount of insulin that I would normally give myself with a large meal and I did it. And then I went to sleep. So Kylie wakes up in the middle of the night because I am seizing. I'm not just like kind of moving around and kind of sweating. I am literally having a seizure, which I'd never had in my entire life. I was flailing my arms and my legs like I had never done before. And I'm completely blacked out. I don't even know this is happening. Okay. I'm sweating big time. And then she wakes up immediately and recognizes exactly what the problem is. She gets up, she goes straight over to uh, the nightstand. She pulls out a, a syringe of glucagon. She goes to prepare it. And glucagon is basically anti-insulin because I was so low that she needed something that, that rapid and that fast. She then goes and gets the glucagon needle, sticks it into my quadricep. And I am moving so erratically that she was only able to get about half of the glucagon injection into my leg before I kicked it out of my leg. Uh, I kicked it out of her hand, and um, as a result of that, it helped my glucose come up a little bit. She gets on the phone. She calls nine one one. Get over here right now. My 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 uh, you know my husband is having a very low blood glucose, and they they arrive within twenty minutes or so. At the time that they arrived, after injecting half of a syringe of glucagon. After having fed, like literally put agave nectar straight into my mouth with a bottle, just like pumping it into the side of my mouth and also feeding me a bunch of raisins to try and increase my glucose quickly. After all of that, 20 minutes down the road, the paramedics arrived to check my blood glucose. I'm at a 23. Okay. I mean, I'm talking like very dangerous. And here's the thing. I haven't told this story to anybody. So like being able to talk about this on this podcast is like, a little bit, uh, you know, it's like hard for me to do. But the truth is that number one, Kylie saved my life. I, if it wasn't for Kylie, I would be dead. Number that, that's how important this decision, this this like mistake was. But number two, uh, this exact scenario is exact is why CGMs can be so powerful, right? Because if I was wearing a CGM at that time, it would have alarmed her that I was going down, and then she would have been able to act quicker before my blood glucose got to like dangerously low levels, right? So that's a really good thing, and I'm, and I'm happy to be wearing the CGM at night. So the solution, just like Kylie had recommended, is that we, I turn off the CGM during the day so that it doesn't piss me off, and I turn the CGM on and, um, at night, and that as a result of that, I'm able to sleep with more confidence. Kylie can sleep with more confidence, and Indigo can sleep with more confidence even though she doesn't know it yet. I mean, on some level, she may. <laughs> yeah, maybe she does at this point. Um, well, you knocked the wind out of me, um, for sure on that one, because I can feel your, I can feel the, the fear. I can absolutely feel the fear and what might actually be kind of interesting to people listening just to know how different life with diabetes is for everyone, insulin dependent, non-insulin dependent is that I take the same insulin pairing that Cyrus does. I take my Lantus in the morning instead of at night. And if I get angry with my sensor, I turn it off at night, not during the day. Now don't, yep. And don't listen to me about turning it off at night. The reason why I turn it off at night is because I'm really sensitive to feeling lows. Thank goodness. After 30 years, I still am super sensitive to feeling it. And I think I sleep light anyways, so it'll wake me up, but I'm also prone to compression error. I sleep heavy, meaning I'm weighted down by two cats that are on me when I'm sleeping and I get compression easily. (laughs) And 
talk about the the twenty percent difference. Is if I'm seventy five and I'm having any kind of a compression issue. I'll go straight down to 54. It sets off the damn alarm and it wakes me up. And I can't play with my sleep because I have a tendency of waking up at 3 a.m. And it's something that I think I've done since childhood when I was diagnosed at 11 because I've always been afraid of going low at night. So this goes so many layers deep into, I mean, your expression of the story. Like this is our intention of this podcast is to get really like – into the reality. Yes, like this life is not just tech and numbers and everyone around us in the medical community, they get so excited about all this new technology coming out. Well, how about, you know, nothing about us without us. Talk to us about what's going on. Learn from people's experiences. And then you'll realize that we aren't excited about all the new tech that you are because we don't know if we can trust it. Here we are. Agreed. Agreed. Now, let me, let me, so I, it's amazing to me actually to hear you say that you turn it off when you go to sleep simply because you have a different pattern of going to sleep and staying asleep. And you're trying to prioritize not waking up in the middle of the night versus me trying to prioritize a device telling me when I have to wake up in the middle of the night because my blood glucose is too low. And not all the time, only certain scenarios will I turn it off. I, when I teach indoor cycling classes, on Tuesday and Friday afternoon, no way will I turn it off. But I am more prone to being lower overnight in those situations. So if I think it's coming up false on me, it's reading me at 80. When I'm going to bed and I feel fine, I might have to turn the, the alarm off because it's going to read the compression rather than my actual body. And I will trust myself to wake up. And that's that's me. That's my life with type 1, folks. That's definitely not medical advice there. <laughs> but eight years later... And eight years later of teaching spin classes, that was my choice with glucose monitoring was so that I could exercise safer. Okay. So let's talk about, let me give a little bit more context here with these compressions because you actually taught me about compression lows because again, I'm new to CGM technology and I didn't know that that was a thing. But when you put on a sensor, at least in the Freestyle Libre world, it's supposed to last for 14 days. Uh, in the Dexcom world, is the sensor also a 14-day sensor? Do you know? I think, I think the 7 is a 14-day they were okay, tens. so the G7 is a 14-day sensor. Okay. Okay, so in theory, you put on a sensor, and then the sensor should be on your body for about two weeks. And then during that two-week period, it should be providing uh, consistent blood glucose readings to your phone anywhere from every two to five minutes, and then give you a blood glucose profile. So that, that should be, in theory, what it's doing, right? Um, however, um, what the compression lows that you're talking about indicate is that when you go to sleep, um, sorry, not necessarily when you go to sleep, at any moment during the day or when you are sleeping, if you have, if you are lying on your sensor or if your sensor is actually experiencing a mechanical compression, then it can give you a false reading. And the false reading, I think, is oftentimes a low reading. Is that, is that correct, Lauren? Personally, anecdotally, yeah. It's the low reading with the compression error. And that is uh, clinically, I'd like to see that in writing. I don't know if we'll be able to actually find it determined in writing that that is what happened, but I tend to go to the party of thousands of people type one that will just tell you straight up what happens when they experience it. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really unfair that it happens during the night when we're sleeping, when otherwise we would be practicing, our healthy habits, getting a good night's sleep, which is also super important to metabolism and to glucose during the day. And instead, it's reading us as false. And what that can lead to, and this actually has happened for people that um, have to type 2 diabetes who wouldn't otherwise experience low blood sugars. And what's happening is getting up during the middle of the night, treating that low blood sugar, potentially with a panic eat. You're eating in panic. You're not eating four glucose tabs or specifically, you know, 12 to 15 grams of carbohydrate. You're panicking and you're treating something that's not happening. And that's exactly where another big blinking light of a problem is being created that wasn't already there to begin with. Yep. Okay. So you just nailed it on the head because again, it's giving you a false reading. And then if you act upon that false reading, uh, you can end up putting yourself in an even more, you know, precarious position. Okay. So the sensors only have technically, you know, like one one piece of real estate on your body. That's a, that's that's an approved location, and that is on the back of your arm. 
So if you look at the instruction manual for the Libre 3, it'll say, make sure that you put the sensor right here, sort of between your tricep and your shoulder or right on the back of your tricep, but somewhere in the sort of like upper arm, like posterior position, right? So if you, you have basically a couple of choices right here on your left arm and a couple of choices right here on your right arm, which is fine. But here's the deal. When you go to sleep, you're sleeping when you're Cyrus and you sleep in the fetal position on the right-hand side or fetal position on the left-hand side, well, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a compression low every single time, right? And so I sleep in three positions. I either sleep like a pencil on my back and then I end up snoring and I bother Kylie, which is not awesome. So then I turn to fetal position on the right and then boom, it triggers a compression low. Or I turn to fetal <laughs> position on the left and it triggers a compression low. And I'm like, great, maybe I should just sleep standing up. This is ridiculous, right? So what a good friend of mine who's wearing the Freestyle Libre 2 educated me about is he said, listen, in Europe, they allow you, it is approved for you to take the sensor and actually um, place it inside of your quadriceps. So it's like, uh, you know, on the medial position inside of your quadricep, um, on the, um, toward like facing the center. And so he showed me the exact location where he puts his sensors and he said, why don't you try this? Because then you won't get the compression low. So I placed it specifically in an area where even if I'm sleeping in fetal position and my legs are together, then it's still not going to give me a compression low on that exact location. So I started doing that and guess what? The compression lows went away and I was like, okay, cool. Number one, I'm injecting it or I'm, I'm adding the sensor or I'm, I'm inserting the sensor in a place where I'm not supposed to. So I hope that this gives me like a somewhat accurate reading. It's probably going to be better than what it was on my arm. And secondarily, maybe my problem is solved because I'm not getting a compression low. But then I went to the gym one day. I go to a gym and I go to a spin class and I'm like, heart rate's elevated and everything's fantastic. And I get out of the gym class and I'm like, man, I just got a really kick butt workout and now my insulin sensitivity is sky high. Fantastic. So I checked my glucose at the end of the workout and it was like 77. So I ate a couple of dates. I didn't overeat and I was like, all right, cool. I'm just going to wait. I sit down in the car and low glucose alarm goes off. And I was like, huh, interesting. So I eat one or two more dates. And then two minutes later, five minutes later, low glucose alarm goes again. And I was like, that's weird. So I eat one more date. And I was like, I'm not going to overeat on these dates because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go sky high. Though the, I got five low glucose alarms and I was like, this is weird, right? And I checked my blood glucose and my blood glucose was, my actual blood glucose meter read that my glucose was like somewhat low. It was like in the 70s or 80s. And so I was doing the right action. And then when I get home about 10 minutes later, all of a sudden my alarm goes off and I check my phone again and I see that my blood glucose profile goes from being flat, 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 flat to literally a straight line up to 191. And, I, and, and the straight line went from low glucose to high glucose within two minutes. And I was like, first of all, that is impossible. That, is, that line that it drew is literally not physiologically possible for your blood glucose to, to rise that quickly. And secondarily, I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, you know what? I think I gave myself another compression low while I was sitting in the car. For some reason, I think that the actual sensor might have been compressed in the position that I was sitting, maybe giving me another compression low. And then at that point, I was looking at my phone and I was like, I'm going to throw this thing through a window if I have to deal with any more of this frustration. I am trying to be so relaxed. I'm trying to be so chill, but this thing is driving me up a freaking wall. Have you ever had anything like that happen to you, Lauren? Two things. Okay. First of all, I cannot believe you got away with putting that on your leg because I've tried this. The Libre 3 app is too smart for that. At least this happened to me. I prefer to wear it on my stomach. I really want to keep it on my stomach because it's a safer space for me. I run into stuff. I'm clumsy and I've ripped this off on a seatbelt before. I mean, like, although the Libre 3 adhesive is much, much better than um, what the, the Libre 1 and 2 were in the past. But I remember I put this on my stomach and I went to scan it to start it. And the app said, this is only approved for the back of your arm. I just, I was busted. I could, and, I, and then I wasted the sensor because it wouldn't work. So it knew. So I don't know how you got used, like got away with that. Second thing is 
Um, we could talk about how the body reacts from a high intensity cycling workout all day long. I could nerd out so hard on that. I'll save the space, but this is how I got obsessed with exercise. Yeah. I got so obsessed with studying endurance exercise because of teaching cycling. I, it just is, I, I'm obsessed with it because it's fascinating. Um, and then you see people without diabetes wearing sensors to learn what we are and you see them training so they get faster in the Tour de France and like all of that is super interesting. I would, I would find it very risky to put the sensor there on that part of the leg um, for a number of different reasons. But the way that the body recovers from a high intensity exercise is quite interesting. A few different things can happen and the cool down is kind of an art. So if you don't normally take, was it a 45 minute class or an hour class? It was a 45 minute class. Was it the kind of class that sends your heart rate up and holds your heart rate high? Or was there variability? Did your heart rate come down? Were you climbing and your heart rate came down? And then did you sprint? Was there variability or did you stay high the whole time? It was sawtooth, up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay. So you think your heart rate moved quite a bit? Heart rate definitely moves quite a bit. No question. Okay. So here's something that's really interesting. And, and if anyone wants to try to understand the function of this is if you're new to sensor technology and you're just walking or you are going all out and you're trying to do something like boot camp, or uh, what's the other thing you do? CrossFit or cycling classes or something like that um, where your heart rate is moving around is if you wear a heart rate monitor and you're also tracking glucose data, there's some very interesting correlations between what happens with your heart rate variability and what happens on the CGM. And it's one really interesting way to help you to help coach people on why does my blood sugar do this at certain times of the workout or afterwards? And it's something I've really watched. So if you're on the lower end of your workout when you finish, that cool down needs to be dragged out a little bit longer. Dragging out the cool down slows down the uptake of glucose into your cell, right? Your cell is just sponging this up at like 50 times the normal rate while you're in the middle of endurance exercise. Drag out the cool down. Don't just stop. Just stopping with glucose knocking on the door, wanting to come back in, freaks out a CGM because a CGM doesn't want to have to work hard. That's when they're most accurate. Variability on a CGM, it wants to stay right here. Time in range between 120 and 150 or lower, right? If it's just swimming and rolling in range, we have more accuracy on the sensor. When the sensor has to think hard, our body is reacting to something. You're putting dates in, but you also stopped exercising like that, unless you did have a 10-minute cool down. Then we're going to have to go backtrack a little bit. But if you stop like that, there's this there's this pocket where your CGM doesn't know what's up. It's alarming you. So maybe you had a combination of a compression low, but you also had physiology still kind of trying to figure out, are we still going or are we still stopped? Where was your heart rate? What was actually happening here? So if we drag things out with the cool down, so you're dropping your heart rate at a little bit more of a, a predictable rate coming down quite quite nicely, you maybe had, would have seen that 70 turn into an 80 and 85 and 90, and it would have slowly risen right back up without having to treat it with the dates. And instead, things like this can happen where I make flashcards when I work with athletes like, oh, did you see this? Let's explain how that right here didn't actually happen. <laughs> so that's the fun with CGNs and exercise, right? But there's always an explanation and, and I know it can be kind of nasty, but... This is this is fascinating, actually, um, because I know exactly what you're talking about, which is that in the post-exercise state, especially when there's like a catecholamine dump from your adrenal gland, that your glucose can do very strange things. So I'm like, I, I'm glad you're bringing this up, but what you're doing is you're you're layering another a, another technology on top of it. So it would be one thing if you were using a blood glucose meter to see what's happening every five minutes, but now you're taking another you're taking a CGM that has unto itself some inaccuracies as we already described. And now you're using that as your readout. So your blood glucose can rapidly change during exercise and after exercise. And then when you have a device that's trying to tell you what's happening while it is experiencing potentially rapid glucose changes in concentration, now all of a sudden you have yourself a grand old quagmire and you're like, you know what? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do right now, but those dates taste awfully tasty. So I'm just going to continue to eat them. <laughs> right? <laughs> Especially when you're done with an aggressive exercise, your body's craving a number of different things. And that's actually, I think with, with Kylie too, like having the non, 
num- like not having to watch this happen. She's watching you react versus watching the numbers happen is living by the numbers and how much that directs our attitude. It directs us. And reactivity is a big word in life with diabetes. Reactivity is something to be careful with. The sensor causes some reactivity. So being able to sit back and analyze a situation before we just go, mm, dates, <laughs> even though it might be the right decision. Reactivity. And you know, I I've know that the cyclists, they'll take their glucose monitor or their CGM or when we had two different devices where we could see our CGM data and our phone is they basically tape it to their handlebars so they can see what their blood is doing every second, which may or may not actually be helpful because you got to listen to you. What kind of decisions did you make? When is the last time you ate? When is the last time you injected insulin? These are the things that are so vital, whether you're testing your finger or you're trusting the sensor. One way or another, we have to have some safety checks, checkpoints. And yeah. So true. And those safety checks, I mean, those, those checkpoints are, you know, I, I think... Unfortunately, for a lot of people, that's not the instruction that people are given when they're, you know, prescribed these devices. It's it's almost, you know, I don't know if if people are actually instructed to also perform blood glucose testing, you know, and and knowing that knowing that you'd still be doing both of those, like Cyrus was describing, you know, he's using t- ultimately he's using two devices every single day now, and um, I'm not sure people would make the same decision about using a CGM if they know that it's going to require them to continue with a lot of blood glucose testing to verify the information that they're seeing. Yeah, you almost have to ask yourself, you're like, what's the point, like? If I'm using a CGM, part of the, the the allure and the draw of using it in the first place is that you don't have to check your blood glucose using a blood glucose meter all the time, right? Now, if you're using a Dexcom, you can calibrate the Dexcom using your blood glucose meter. So every once in a while, the Dexcom will prompt you and it'll say, time to calibrate. And then you go, okay, cool. Check your blood glucose meter. And then you're like, oh, my glucose meter says I'm at 114 Hey, Dexcom, I'm at 114. Enter. And it goes, cool. Thanks for the information. And then it uses that as part of its brain to make sure that the future readings are, are much more accurate. You can't do that with the Freestyle Libre, which I think is a huge design flaw, if you ask me, right? Because there's no feedback mechanism for me to be able to tell the app or the Dexcom, se- I'm sorry, or the, the Freestyle sensor whether or not it's doing a good job. Right, and I think that's a, that's that's just a massive problem because if it never knows whether or not it's accurate, it's just going to assume it's going to operate under the assumption that it is accurate. When in reality, I can I can prove without any shadow of a doubt that it is not. Right now, can we also talk about um, mind games that the app has actually created uh, for me, or that the, the mind games that, that that occurs? Okay. I've been I've been staring at this blood glucose profile inside of the, the the Freestyle Libre app for like ever since I first got this thing and I'm like I keep on asking myself the question I'm like how do I get this thing to be as flat as possible because that's ultimately what every person with type 1 diabetes is looking for every person with type 2 diabetes and even non-diabetics they're just like just give me a nice normal physiological variation somewhere between 70 and 130 keep it there all day long and then my problems are solved. That's going to lower my risk for future complications, and it's going to keep me. It's going to it's going to keep my energy levels high, and it's going to maximize my uh, you know my longevity on this planet, right? So that's what everybody's after, including me, right? So going back to what we were saying earlier, if I turn this thing off and I check my blood glucose the way that I've always been doing it as a normal human being, what I will find is that when I check my blood glucose. Uh, I'm checking it, call it maybe every two hours or so. I'll get like a 96 now and then 132 after a meal and then 110 an hour later and then an 84 before dinner and so on and so forth. And if I just kind of like loosely connect the dots on like six to seven to eight blood glucose checks throughout the day, well then guess what? My time and range is quite high. It's in the 90%, which is fantastic. But I'm only taking, you know, eight, nine, 10 blood glucose measurements and the corollary to that is, well, Cyrus, maybe, maybe there was a really high, you know, blood glucose reading in between your blood glucose checks, and maybe you just missed it, right? Maybe an hour after you ate, your blood glucose went up to a 220, 
And then by the time you checked it, it was back down to 130 and you just didn't see it. So here you are assuming that your glucose is in range, but in reality it's not. So I was like, all right, I'll accept that. Let me go check more frequently. So then I would check more frequently every hour on the hour and it just proved exactly what I was thinking, which is that glucose is nicely controlled. So cool, that's a nice thing. So what I'm getting at here is that when, when you look at the actual blood glucose profile that the app itself draws you, I was sitting here thinking that I was looking at it and I was like, why is it so jagged? Why is it so jagged? Why is it so jagged? And then I, boom, it dawned on me. And I was like, oh, you, you, oh, so frustrating. Okay. The app manufacturers have taken the, what, what I'm looking at here. This is what I'm looking at. I don't know if you can see this on the screen right here. Okay. This is actually considered to be, this is, this is, it's super reactive, right? It doesn't look good. It, it looks very jagged. But in reality, this is, this is a pretty high time and range with the exception of those, you know, one, two, three, four glucose lows, right? The way that this graph is drawn, the way, the way that they display it on the Freestyle Libre 3 app is they take the x-axis, which is time, and they compress it because your phone is a vertical device. So they compress the x-axis and then the y-axis is elongated. So if you take any graph and you compress the x-axis and you elongate the y-axis, then you're going to turn a normal, let's call it a normal sine wave, and you're going to turn it into something that looks like mountains. Because again, you're compressing the x-axis and you're elongating the y-axis, and that's going to get a higher amplitude, and it's going to make it look more jagged. And so when I first saw that, I was like, man, this is frustrating. So let me turn my phone horizontal, and then it should appear a little bit more natural. You can't do that in this app. It literally will not turn horizontal. You have to go to your computer in order to do that. And I'm not going to sit in front of my computer all day long in order to visualize it. The Dexcom allows you to look at it horizontal. And when you do that, you start to see that there's a much more normal blood glucose variation. And as a result of that, emotionally, as the user, you look at it and you're like, okay, cool. The world is a good place. When I look at this graph, I think to myself, damn it, Cyrus, you're making a mistake. Why is there such a steep rise and a steep fall? Why is it going up and then down and then up and then down and then up and then down? Oh, the reason for that is because the actual display itself on the app is distorted. And as a result of that, I am getting emotionally frustrated over something that is actually, in my opinion, designed very poorly. Am I being too harsh and critical? No, that's exactly why I make flashcards because this is what you wanted to see and that's the, re that's the reality of what actually happened. That's 100% time and range and that's the nature of the human body is to roll. It's not to go, Z -Z, never mind, Z -Z, never mind, Z -Z, never mind, especially when you don't make insulin, you don't react that quick. It doesn't react that quick. That's just how it, how it operates. That's why I say it doesn't want to work hard. And they didn't even study that. They didn't even look at the accuracy of those rapid movements. But I didn't realize that this was an axis issue, <laughs> axi issue. Um, boy, it takes an engineer to notice those kinds of things, doesn't it, Kylie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, there's a problem and he'll solve it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, like, I, I just want to preface this whole conversation with like, my goal in going into this experiment is not to be a naysayer. I'm not trying to pick out all the flaws and point out all the things that they could have done better. I'm just trying to use the technology to my advantage so that I can gain value from it and make Kylie's life easier and make my life easier. But in the process, it's just been like one roadblock after another, after another, after another. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, how many billions of dollars did you guys into invest into this technology and how many years and how many clinical trials and how many meetings with the FDA in order to give me and other users an app and a device that is just plain problematic, right? And again... I sound like I'm a being a jerk here, but maybe we're just premature. Maybe a year from now, this conversation is going to be moot because the sensor will be more accurate. It's not going to have as many compression lows. The app will be fixed. And all of a sudden now, great. You know, everybody can, you know, sing Kumbaya and hold hands together. That would be awesome. I can't wait to get to that point. I think it's, I actually honestly think the problem is about to amplify. Um, and it already has been amplifying. It already has been amplifying and there's a huge hole in the market because of it. Well. People are turned on to this. In Europe, um, the Freestyle Libre, amazingly, is easier to get, which actually doesn't surprise anybody. And there have been athletes without 
diabetes using this for their own understanding of glucose. They're learning a lot about nutrition. And in fact, what they're mostly saying is if they're learning that they need to eat more carbohydrates, oh, really? <laughs> and interestingly enough, as a dietitian, if you just run the numbers based on sports nutrition, you will basically find out the same thing that in the world of cycling, you guys needed more carbohydrates the entire time. You needed it during your exercise while you're burning anyways, but it took the technology to teach them a lesson about loading carbohydrate. But now they're they're taking in so much so much carbohydrate. And the reason why I can say this is because there are cycling videos going on in this house all the time because of my husband Tyler. It's just cycling, cycling, cycling. And he, what's fun is I can hear this and he will ask me questions and then I'll get to take a look at what's going on there and what they're using. So anyway, this has been going on in the greater world of looking at glucose. And all you have to do if you're in this world at all is spend 10 seconds on social media and you have this, that, and the other person who's worn a CGM for 10 seconds who's now going to call themselves an expert, which is not only offensive to someone like me, but it's completely inaccurate and inappropriate to act like that. So what it is, is no one should be given a CGM without a coach who really understands this information. And guess how many people on the planet do? Yep. How many people on the planet actually understand this? So your doctor that has claimed to be some holistic, integrative, yada, yada, is just handing out sensors somehow to folks that are just putting them on. And what we know for sure is within the first month is when the greatest inaccuracies happen. The longer someone wears a sensor, it seems in a way that the sensor starts to read a person more accurately, which is a whole nother can of worms in a sense of how does that make any sense? But it's actually been quite visible for people anecdotally to notice that accuracy improves the longer they wear the sensor. But then Dexcom, it was just announced, beat Abbott to market to sell sensors for people without diabetes over the counter. And apparently that's going to happen at the end of this summer. Oh my gosh. How Abbott got beat to market is major. Um, so anyway, this situation is going to get bigger and um, yeah, I'm going to make the biggest plug ever. And I'm going to say, you need a coach that understands sensors. I hope you heard enough today. <laughs> Look no further. <laughs> right. We are here for it. I mean, that is one of the cool things about our team and what we are offering people is that we help with not only understanding how to use the technology, specifically the how to, like, wh how do I put it on? Like, we've coached people through application of <laughs> the sensor, but also how to interpret the information properly so that's meaningful for you. And that's why working, like to your point, Lauren, working with a coach is so incredibly valuable because you gain the insight. You're not just stuck being frustrated. I mean, now, you know, and just as like a little side note here, Cyrus is obviously, you know, like as far as, as in terms of his knowledge of diabetes, his knowledge of blood glucose um, functioning in the body and, and, and glucose functioning in the body and, and, it's that frustrating for Cyrus for as long as he's lived with type 1 diabetes, for as, as much as he's um, you know developed a, a program to teach people about this, he's left frustrated, you know So to have somebody on your side who can help you understand how am I going to integrate this technology into my life? What am I going to do when I sense a problem? like we talked about last week, what are the check you know like how do we how do we use this? Um, supportively, rather than it just being a frustrating thing that is another reason for you to get frustrated with your diabetes health or any of your other health conditions. You know, it's um, working with a coach can be just it can change your entire perception on this tool, right? It's just another tool in the tool belt it can change your experience with it, and. We've had clients who have said to us, you know, we're making different choices because of what we see on the CGM. You know, like that's a, and that's a positive thing. If you can use the information to help support your choices, especially when they're green light choices, that's the ultimate goal. And I'm not sure that is clearly communicated when a prescription is written for this technology, this device, you know? So I love that plug. Well said, well said. And one thing that I want to add to this is that. I do believe, I, I fully agree with you guys, which is that anybody who's using a CGM should also be prescribed a coach. But as you guys know, all coaches are not created equal, right? And you could take, uh, you know, you could put a hundred coaches in a room who all have like advanced degrees and certifications. And you could say, 
how do you interpret a CGM and how do you interpret a CGM and how do you interpret a CGM? And truth be told, you might get a hundred different responses because some people operate under the methodology of eating a low carbohydrate diet as the only way to keep your blood glucose profile flat. And some people operate under the methodology of no, 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 no. You actually want to be eating a medium carbohydrate diet and, and doing it with as minimum saturated fat because that's a way to keep it flat. Other people might say, oh, no, 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 you're just not exercising enough. You can eat whatever you want. Just make sure you exercise and that'll keep your both profile flat. And then there's us who says, no, 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 you actually want to be eating a medium to high amount of carbohydrate from plant-based sources, lowering your total fat content and exercising frequently, and that's going to keep you flat, right? We're not expecting flat. We're not looking for flat. And that's the other thing. We won't teach you that flat blood glucose is where you're supposed to live. And variability in blood glucose is expected. It is normal physiology. We we plan on having elevations after meals, especially because that's what carbohydrates do in, when they break down to glucose. So we are not expecting flat, but we are promising improved time and range. And we are... You know, so we will, and that's where we come in to help direct some of that, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for calling me out on that. The, I, I use the wrong word. Flat is not the right word. That's literally the smartest thing that you've said for the last decade. Rolling in range. In range is the, type, is the right expression to use, right? So the question then becomes, well, what is in range, right? If you ask people that are coming from the ketogenic world, they will tell you that in range is anywhere from 70 to 110. They literally make a cutoff of 110 and they refer to a glucose spike as being anything over 110. And I'm like, where did you come up with this? It doesn't make sense. If you look in the research, you'll see that non-diabetic physiological blood glucose variation can go as high as 153 in the post-meal state. Right. And there is literally documented science, multiple papers that are demonstrating this in, again, non diabetic individuals. So, Kylie, you bring up a phenomenal point, which is we're not trying to get you flat. And, Lauren, you bring up the right point. We are trying to get you rolling in range. And our range is somewhere between 70 and 130, 70 and 140, because that's what a non diabetic is going to be rolling between. Uh, and if we can get you to get there and stay there as much as possible and increase your time and range to 90, 95, 99%, well then guess what? You're going to live a long time on this planet. Oh, Kylie, my heart. When you jumped in and said that, I was like, oh, yes. good. <laughs> Great yes, because I like, like, you know, as, um, you know, the first, in the first place, the clinical standards between 70 and 180. It's the first place to get to if you're struggling to do that. You know, there's a step by step process to remove these words like perfection. And if the technology is sending you into a place where you feel even worse about hitting goals and you're paying any attention to systems that try to force you to stay between 70 and 110, anyone who's active moderately, that's not possible and it's not safe. Um, that variability, I mean, what's what's 20% off if you're trying to stay at 70 to 75 all the time? Come on. that's that's You're going to hit your A1C in, 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 below 6% because you're low 50% of the time. You're in an unsafe space. And also, you're starving your body and your brain of all the nourishment that it needs when you do something like that. So anyway, I'm pretty sure that, I don't know, this podcast crushed it today. That's just my overall feeling. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you for having this conversation with me because I've been trying to like vent to someone, but not again, not vent from like just an emotional perspective, vent from like a technical perspective and, and point out all the things that are frustrating about this technology. But also going back to what I was saying, there, there are some very positive aspects of CGM technology. And I hope that the technology continues to improve over the course of time. So on one hand, there's the actual technological, uh, you know, there's there, sorry, there's the underlying software and hardware that have to communicate with each other in order to provide accurate information. And then on top of that, you have human emotion, which gets, which is a whole different thing. And, and there's an interaction between the two of them. So the goal is for you as a human being to be able to use this information to your advantage, to add value to your life and not get emotionally triggered by what you see and um, you know, use it as a tool that you can improve your life with over the long term. It's moving in the right direction. It's just not there yet. Kylie. Well said. 
I mean, I'm just so glad to have this whole conversation. And the fact that we're having it with you, Cyrus, I think is actually really powerful. And uh, because you've recently started using this technology yourself after years of blood glucose monitoring, and you know, and I am grateful that you were open to trying it because it has brought us value in, at nighttime in particular. And um, you know, back to the story you were telling about the, you know, your hypoglycemic episode. I mean, you know, for those of us who are the partners to people living with diabetes, it can be really scary. You know, I, I lost a lot of sleep for the months after that event because it was very traumatizing to res- res- basically like to resuscitate you in bed. I mean, that was ultimately what happened. And um, that's a big responsibility for people who are partners. And I will say that this addition has helped me to sleep so much better at night knowing that we'll get alerted. So I'm, I am really glad it's, it's available and I'm glad you were open to trying it out. Um, I think that we still have some work to do to learn it and to figure it out. But, and that's where, again, if you're new to any technology, right, it takes time. It takes time to integrate it. It takes time to learn it. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm glad to have these very powerful conversations about the realities of life with diabetes from everybody's point of view. And, um, I thank you guys both for sharing your personal stories and, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. We're, we're, I'm glad we can hold space for this here. So yay. (laughs) Yay. And yay spring. Today's the first day of spring. Let's get springy. (laughs) Let's spring into the rest of the (laughs) season. Well, thank you, all of you guys who are listening. Um, and if you stuck with us for this long, that's fantastic. If you or somebody else you know is looking for a coach and wants to help them interpret how to use their CGM so that they can use it to their advantage, or maybe somebody who's just trying to get control of their blood glucose, even if they're not using a CGM and don't even care about a CGM, uh, come our direction. We That's what we do. Lauren is a phenomenal coach. Kylie is a phenomenal coach. And we have a whole team of 15 other coaches who are just absolute savants when it comes to controlling your blood glucose and reducing your risk for long-term complications um, and getting to a point where you can reverse, in most cases, prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and get exquisite control over type 1. So if you're interested, go to masteringdiabetes.org. On our website, click on the very top menu. There's a little button that says personalized coaching. Just click right there. It'll take you to a page where you can enter your name and information And you can get on a phone call with somebody on our team and we can see if you might be a good fit for a coaching program that will guaranteed change your life. Let's do it. (laughs) I love this. Thanks, Cyrus. Thanks for being on here with us. And um, Lauren, as always, uh, you are just a wealth of knowledge. And um, I'm like, I listen to the two of you and I'm like, goodness. There's just so much information here. It's amazing. Well, I warned you that I was performance enhancing today. I'm caffeinated and that doesn't always happen. So I was, I knew like for Cyrus, we're, we're, we're hitting the Nespresso today. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I love it. I love it. I love Lauren's it. Lauren's amped on this topic. <laughs> yeah, well, this is so much fun. Thank you for opening up the topic. I feel like I've let, I feel like I've released years worth of holding something in just talking about it fantastic Mm -hmm. yeah well we yeah this is great (laughs) well have have a great day you guys and we'll see you next time